Hello and welcome to What Would Jane Do? A podcast aimed at all you Janeites out there. And it's brought to you by Julia Golding, that's me. And I'm an author and someone who adores Jane Austen. I've also written a children's series, Imagining Jane Austen as a Young Detective. And I'm joined today by my regular podcast pal, <laughs> Katie. So Katie, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, by day I uh, work in a contact centre, as you can tell by the charming uh, Regency inspired headset and microphone I'm wearing today. Uh, but uh, by my, in my other life, I am a Regency reenactor uh, and Jane Austen aficionado as well. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm straddling both worlds tonight as I can't find my more discreet ear pods. Yes. Uh, so, so we're welcoming technology, I think, into this podcast, aren't we, Julia? We are. We were, we've actually had a bit of a break because uh, I've been a bit busy doing other things. And since we spoke to Jane Austen's great, 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 great niece, um, which was a high point of the year, <laughs> and we thought we couldn't let the year go by without actually doing our Christmas episode. And we were thinking through what were the major themes of the year. And it seemed to us, or in fact, I think, Kate, it was your husband who it <laughs> this, wasn't it? another Regency reenactor. Yes. We should tackle the subject of Jane Austen and AI. Now, (laughs) at the first glance, there doesn't seem (laughs) to be much of a connection between Jane's era when the sort of top technology of the time was steam engines (laughs) and they were only just getting going. And so the whole idea of technology and machinery of the sort of industrial sort was in its infancy But actually, when you start to think about it a little bit more and bring your mind to bear on the subject, there are a lot of more connections than you would think. Oh, yeah. We're going to think about Jane's era as a time of technological change. Yeah. So let's first go to you, Katie. When you're doing your Regency reenactments, is there any technology involved from the era that you're using? Um. Well, it's very basic technology, like if I'm churning butter, <laughs> somebody's created a... Well, that's a kind of machine, I suppose. <laughs> a, a, really, a really suitable uh, way of churning it efficiently um, with, with a, a wooden uh, sort of plunger, if you like, with holes in it that sort of uh, churns it very efficiently and a, a sort of tubular-shaped uh, uh, churn tub so that, uh, you know, maximum fi- efficiency. So little children love the, the squelchy sound it makes. Um there are people who uh, use uh, effective ways of knitting. So there was a famous group called the Wensleydale Knitters um, that were so uh, good at uh, knitting. They could knit a pair of socks on the way to market uh, and they could knit with one hand. So they'd tuck, so technology, if you like, was tucking one of their needles, as we would call it today, under their arm and knit one-handed. So they effectively had two needles, but they were just using one hand to do it. So that that's amazingly technological advanced uh, for these days when most people wouldn't even know how to start making a pair of socks. So, yeah, that thank you for mentioning the people knitting socks, because that's where I was going to go with this, which is. In fact, Jane's era was going through something quite similar to what we're going through now, which is the fear that newfangled machines are going to come in and take over our jobs it was a really real present danger. Because... Yeah, it was, it was an absolutely realistic fear. Yeah. And in fact, the reason that a lot of us give for being part of a Yorkshire regiment, because we're part of a regiment called the 33rd Foot, uh, which was prevalent in and still is really in the area uh, of Leeds, Bradford, Huddersfield, Dewsbury, around that area. So it's all West Yorkshire, uh, was because the army was the best alternative to starving. Uh, because mm. a lot of weavers and knitters who had been working in a cottage industry for years and generation to generation were very suddenly being put out of business by the new mills and manufacturers that were springing up. Uh, people were moving from villages into towns where they could find work. But a lot of people who had survived their whole life being craftspeople, if you like, were suddenly out of business. And it was a, it was a very, very uh, prevalent fear and and no wonder people were fearful of it because their whole lives would would change in a, a matter of months 
Yeah. So if you take 1812, just for example, Uh um, there were riots in Nottingham, which is a Midlands town in England, um, about the the new frame machines, which were for making stockings. Nottingham had been the traditional centre for this particular craft. And they were watching these new frames come in. You needed a sort of ability to set them up. But once they get going, they're replacing the work and doing it much more quickly Mm. and the response of the workers who couldn't see other forms of employment in their area was to attack the frame uh, frame breakers and then this had a knock-on effect in in that parliament who represented the landowners and the factory owners those that side of the debate they actually passed legislation which made frame breaking a capital offense i.e death penalty yeah. And this spreads out to involve all sorts of interesting people at the time, including Lord Byron, who, as a young man making his maiden speech in the House of Lords, spoke on the Whig side, the more progressive. Well, there wasn't much difference between Whigs and Tories, really, but <laughs> on the slightly more reform side, <laughs> um, arguing that you shouldn't make it a capital offence because these people are reacting out of desperation. Yes, it definitely uh, not spiced spite or malice. No, uh, it, like it was uh, it was fear, uh, and and it was a realization that their way of life was just gone uh, very very quickly, as technology often uh, does come upon us. Uh, one minute, one minute you think everything is is swimming along, and then suddenly uh, a transformative technology appears almost overnight. It appears sometimes, and just sweeps away anything that has gone before it. Uh, so it, it was interesting at the time um, that when you were hand weaving, my husband has a length of cloth um, for a plaid. He's a McFarlane. Um, so he's he's done a Jacobite impression recently. Uh, and he's sewn this plaid together um, because you could only weave as far as you could reach. So that was the length of your piece of cloth as far as you could reach. So with with new technology coming in, you could weave much wider uh, bits of cloth, which was interesting. And there's a saying called from between Hell, Hull and Halifax, the good Lord deliver us. There's a gibbet at Halifax where you could literally be executed for stealing cloth. And that might seem very extreme to us today. Um, but I think, as I mentioned before on this podcast, um, you were basically literally putting a family out of work and starving because they lived from piece to piece that they could weave. And by selling their previous piece of cloth, they'd have enough funds to buy a new piece of uh, materials to weave a new piece of cloth. And if that was interrupted, you could literally have a family starving, unable to pay the rent. It was it was very, very precarious way of living, but a way that they'd lived for years. And suddenly all these mill owners come along um, and, and, and basically, uh, again, my, my uh, husband says, that we, we didn't really have slavery in Britain as you would recognize it in other parts of the country, because you didn't need to, because the mill owners could basically turn you off if you were sick or um, you couldn't work, you got injured. There was no uh, benefit system or anything like that. There was the poor house, which was so horrible that most people would rather starve than go there. Um, but they were effectively, they didn't need slaves because of the, the low wages they charged. People were desperate for work. Um, so, so that was, uh, there were good mill owners. And I think uh, uh, anyone who's uh, read North and South <laughs> will, will, will see, you know, what's a good mill owner, what's a poor mill owner. Um, but they were, it was very much making up uh, a, a very low paid labor force. Um, so, so they would have possibly been no, no worse off than they had been before. But it was uh, the accident rate uh, and child labour laws came in because of conditions as a lot of mills. Yeah, I mean, funnily enough, this is actually the area I did my um, doctorate on. Really, Judy? Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, looking at the parallels between the factory reform mm. movement and the anti-slavery movement involving mm. some of the same people. And yeah. whilst there was obviously a completely different business around the stealing of um, people from Africa and dragging mm. them over as prisoners, slaves. Mm. It's a whole different sort of thing. But th- some of the conditions of work were not, as you say, they weren't that different. And there was a Scottish mine, for example, where they used to put collars 
on yes. the floor, and you could only spend your wages in the shop owned by the miner. Oh yeah, it was a very so closed. It business. was a closed system where you couldn't escape from, and your choice yeah. was to die. Or and, and you had women and children working down the mines. That was a, yeah. a because they were small enough to get into little spaces and, and pulling carts and things like that. So they couldn't necessarily do all the heavy chipping away at the actual stone, but they could certainly do. Uh, a lot of other heavy heavy lifting so the conditions were absolutely uh, appalling by our modern standards yeah so outside the um, fictional world of um Elizabeth Gaskell and north and south but looking earlier uh -huh. there's obviously the real uh biggest factory enterprise of her of Jane Austen's day was actually New Lanark yeah it was a water powered mill uh, not that far from Glasgow and it was owned by a progressive land um, factory owner who uh -huh. set up like an ideal village where people uh -huh. had their own bit of land. They also had access to education. Um, they took in a lot of the people who were cleared off the highlands through the uh -huh. highland clearances, uh -huh. a sort of land grab that was going on. Yes, yes. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's not good. But he did provide employment in fairly ideal community conditions for its time. Yeah, I think I, just, I think that was uh, uh, driven as well by the religious idea of if you have more, you should your duty is to improve the the well being of of those around you, not necessarily give them all your money, but certainly um, look after their morals, um, house them, feed them, clothe them yeah. if you're going to use them. And there's a, a really interesting, I think it's National Trust owned mill called Style, near, not so far away from where I live, uh, I think near Manchester. And that's really interesting to visit because it it shows right from um, the, the sort of uh, 1790s, I think, when they first did this. It, it talks about how the technology moved on from uh, water power to steam power. And, and it's got lots of uh, very interesting looms and things to have a look at and talks about the history of the family who owned the mills and how they did have schools and, and basically uh, had their own workforce on site and housed them and fed them. Uh, and train them up to work in the mills. So, and and how various uh, world events shaped uh, how successful the mill was. Yeah. So, um, going back to New Lanark, which mm -hmm. another, if people are visiting the UK, it's a world heritage site, a great place to go and visit. But if you don't come to the UK, can I recommend one of my own books? <laughs> All right, then go on. So, yeah. So, my <laughs> early series I wrote. Um, which actually should appeal to uh, Jane Austen fans is uh, a series about a it's a children's series starts with the Diamond of Drury Lane. That's Cat features... Royal. Cat Royal, that's right. Book number six, Cat's Cradle, is actually set in New Lanark, mm. and it's looking at well, you 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 can go and visit the mill through the adventure that the uh, that Cat is having when she goes up to Scotland. Mm. So um, you can see how it ran as the top technology of its era. Mm. Okay, right. Let's go back to AI, which, of course, the, the thing about AI, the other aspect of it, uh, as well as taking people's jobs, it's the idea that artificial intelligence can think as cleverly and wittily as the rest of us. And so authors like me will no longer have a job in the future because you, <laughs> you dear reader, can plug into um, some engine a new, you know, a new fantasy murder mystery story with this and that in it, and it will produce it for you. The sort of something for nothing type world. <laughs> and I thought, well, what is Chat GPT actually doing about Jane Austen? The entirety of Jane Austen's work has been fed into this machine because mm -hmm. it's all out of copyright. So mm -hmm. just before coming on, I thought, okay, let's have a Christmas short story in the style of Jane Austen, 300 <laughs> words long yes, um, to entertain you. Would you like to hear the story? Yes, I would. You can shout stop when you get absolutely right, infuriated. <laughs> Here we go. So what do you think, guys? Is this actually Jane Austen's style? Can we tell the difference, dear reader? Yes. Miss Catherine Everly. Promising start. We got, you know, a vaguely plausible name. <laughs> Strolled through the snow-covered gardens of Pemberley, a gentle smile gracing her countenance. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Jane Austen is already throwing her pen at this AI. Yeah. The air was crisp and the merriment of the season enveloped the grand estate. 
A light snowfall adorned the evergreen branches, casting a serene spell upon the landscape. This is Jane Austen via Barbara Cartland, I think. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> Catherine's thoughts were occupied by the upcoming Christmas Eve ball, a gathering of the finest society in the county. She had heard whispers of a mysterious stranger who would be in attendance, a gentleman of consequence and intrigue. Such <laughs> rumours had ignited a spark of curiosity within her heart. <laughs> I would just like to point out before I go any further, there is no dialogue yet. So it's yeah. already not really in the or internalised thoughts. It's just so not Jane Austen style. No, no. As she approached the Pemberley drawing room, adorned with festive greenery and flickering candlelight. <laughs> how do you adorn it with flick? Anyway, Catherine <laughs> noticed the air of anticipation. How do you notice an air of anticipation <laughs> among the assembled guests? Her eyes, however, were drawn to a tall figure standing by the grand fireplace. A man of refined demeanour, with a countenance that bespoke both <laughs> wit and charm. And 10,000 a year. <laughs> that, that, it misses that. I mean, come on. How? How can it miss that? <laughs> Hang on. We're coming. It's not many, much longer of this pain. No, that's all right. This is funny. Their eyes met across the room. <laughs> You're right about the Barbara Carton. And a <laughs> silent understanding passed between them. Catherine felt her heart flutter as the mysterious stranger approached, a glint of amusement in his gaze. Miss Everly, he said with a bow, <laughs> I am Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy, a humble guest in this splendid abode. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what you say to people at parties. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Kate, and I'm a humble guest <laughs> in this splendid house. Might I have the pleasure of your company for the next dance? <laughs> Catherine curtsied in acknowledgement, her cheeks tinted with a delicate blush. As they glided through the dance, the strains of the music surrounded them like a magical spell. And in that moment, Pemberley transformed into a haven of joy and enchantment. <laughs> and here's the last sentence, the last paragraph. The night unfolded with laughter, conversation, and the warmth of newfound companionship. Oh. Eef the mistletoe. Mr. Darcy and Miss Everly shared a fleeting moment, their hearts entwined in the spirit of Christmas. What does Elizabeth Bennet think about this? That's what I want to know. And so, in the grand halls of Pemberley, amidst the snowflakes... <laughs> Sorry, I hadn't spotted that. <laughs> it's now snowing inside. And yeah. the snowflakes and candlelight, a timeless romance blossomed, promising a holiday <laughs> season to be cherished in the years to come. <laughs> Well, could you I tell, I, I, I could you tell is... Katie, that that was not written by Jane Austen? Just, oh, just think about oh, that for a moment. I can't put my finger on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, I think Pemberley Manor should be renamed Cliche Manor. <laughs> it was just like, I, th I think a good game would be spot how many cliches there are in the, in that. It was actually um, having read several AI uh, artificial intelligence produced bits of text um i was quite surprised it wasn't stranger um it, it, it came across as somebody writing fan fiction who'd read a lot of regency romances uh and almost the exact opposite of what jane austen would do um because jane austen as, as we know anyone who loves and, and reads her regularly um is is very good at putting things in a way that sounds very simple, but every word has been chosen to be almost the opposite of a cliche. Um, it's, it's incredibly well-crafted um, and you pick up very subtle uh, information uh, without almost realizing it, but she has chosen every word absolutely meticulously um, to convey a lot of information in a very easy and short way. I tell you what it's like. Mm. Tell it me what is, it's like, Julia. It is actually <laughs> spot on for Jane Austen, Juvenilia. Yes, that, that could be you it. You know, yeah. love and friendship, that thing where it's so full of cliches yes. that it becomes funny. Ha have you read um, Daisy Ashford, The Young Visitors? Yes. That yeah. is very similar to that. It's, it's, it's a child's idea of what a grown-up 
romance might be like, but it's unintentionally absolutely hilarious because of all the semi cliches she puts in, in in very strange and weird ways, which is which is wonderful. So I can highly recommend that for your Christmas reading viewers, the, the Young Visitors by Daisy Ashford. So I think in in short, we're not yet at a, the stage when Chat GPT can replace Jane Austen's novels. I hope um, not. <laughs> I thought just just to, because this is our Christi Christmas festive fun. I thought I would also say, how about having a Jane Austen esque poem? Okay. Have you got um, one of those? Has, has AI generated one of those? AI, it, it does tend to rather spew out rather too much. I must have, <laughs> I, should, I should have given it a, a word limit. I did actually have a go at doing a haiku um, oh, yes. earlier in the year, and that was quite successful, not in mm. Jane Austen style, but just for, no. for a family sort of amusement. Mm. So when it has to concentrate on fewer words, it does better. Yes. But I did think there was something quite pleasant about this poem in as a celebration of Jane okay. Austen, as mm -hmm. opposed I mean anyway it's funny too mm. unintentionally <laughs> um but there was anyway I thought it was it was worth sharing with you okay uh, if I can do this share away face. <laughs> it starts really badly <laughs> in yuletide's glow when snowflakes fall so light a festive eve adorned in hues so bright. In drawing rooms with candles flickering near, a tale of Christmas love begins, my dear. Beneath the holly where the fire's warm embrace, two hearts entwine in a dance of grace. Gentle whispers neath the mistletoe, in regency echoes, love starts to grow. Amidst the carols, their notes fill the air, a serenade sweet, a moment so rare. In candlelit parlours, secrets unfold, as sentiments bloom in letters old. A snowy landscape draped in glistening white reflects the magic of this wondrous night. A carriage approaches through the wintry scene, bringing hope and joy, a romantic dream. With silken gowns and waistcoats so fine, the festive ballroom, a celestial sign. A dance commenced, a courtship so true, in every step, love steadily grew. Underneath the mistletoe's silent decree, a stolen glance, a shared jubilee. In Jane Austen's world, where manners are art, a Christmas tale, a love to impart. So, as the snowflakes descend from above, embrace the spirit of kindness and love. In the elegance of Austen's prose, a Christmas enchantment forever glows. Oh. Not entirely <laughs> rubbish. I Not mean, entirely rubbish, no. No, I mean, it, get, it gets into its stride, I think. Yes. Quite like some of the, what for me this does is it picks up little images that hint. It's not trying to be Jane Austen. No. Case. It's sort of thinking, well, I was going to boil it down to some little fleeting moments. A carriage approaches through the wintry scene. Yes. As with Emma. Um silken gowns and waistcoats i mean <laughs> just those little images seem quite nice um but but what always um amuses me about uh, a regency christmas uh, which we've talked about in previous podcasts um it's it's a lovely idea but when you actually see what jane austen writes about as a regency christmas um uh christmas gatherings coming together um it's mr woodhouse worrying about the snow <laughs> um, it's it's uh, Emma avoiding Mr. Elton uh, and desperately trying to overhear gossip. Um, so there's a lot more liveliness going on there than sort of, oh, it's so romantic here. It's it's a really good gathering and, and chance to basically uh, show everybody's different characters off. Uh, it, 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 there's lots there's lots to pick apart in people's behaviours, and that's uh, far more interesting often than romance. <laughs> Yes, that, that's true, because I wouldn't actually say that Jane Austen wrote romances. I think no. she writes romance is part comic of comic realism it's, with a Yes, it's not, it's not the, the be all and end all of it. It's it's a byproduct of it, I think. And the, well, the, the, well, for me anyway, it's it's a, it's it's definitely an integral part of it. It's social commentary, yes. 
the social comedies because oh, comedy, yes a yes. comedy often has a romance in it which, which it does and it makes it more powerful to, happiness to, yes to, to mm. put that point across absolutely um and i i think um lots of people love jane austen for the romance there's no doubt about that um but i think you can and i have read an awful lot of regency romances and not get half as much in, enjoyment out of the uh the the interactions between people because obviously as romances often do just focuses on the two protagonists with very little going on around them whereas i think jane austen um you're surrounded in in a world and you are very much aware of lots of interactions going on not just between the the hero and the heroine but all the people around them and how that plays into the story as well and it, it it's very immersive as for the regency period um, so you feel that you are part of a world and maybe that's one of the main attractions is it's not just a story between two people. It, you are immersed in the Regency uh, families uh, of the time and, and you get a little slice of uh, people's in, interactions going on, which is you know, very, very um, not addictive, but 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 yeah, entrancing, in, in entertaining, entertaining. Yeah, so I think those um, particular poems and little short story seem to be a bit Bridgerton in their approach. Yes, it's kind of more surface, whereas whereas I like Jane Austen because you can just take it as surface reading and lots of people do. But there's so much going on beneath the surface um, uh, and, and, you know, people's motivations and people recognise themselves in so many characters and their behaviours. And that, that's what makes it so immediate for people even now even sort of over 200 years later you can so recognize people's behaviors i think you're right about that immersive thing and that's absolutely key because mm. i was talking um in another uh, another podcast mm -hmm. uh, about the trend in fantasy to have these universes so doctor who now has the universe and the marvel yeah. universe the dc yeah. universe Potter that's, universe. yeah and i was thinking of <laughs> all the sort of fandoms and then suddenly i thought oh my goodness jane austen has one too oh boy does she have fandoms? Day nights. <laughs> Day nights and extensions of her work oh, yes. and so in fact i couldn't think of another non-fantasy property that had the same thing around it so dickens though it does have extensions there isn't really a that I'm aware of a lively Dickens fandom. He's just like Shakespeare. He's there. Mm. Uh, he doesn't have a Shakespeare universe or a Dickens universe. Whereas I do think that Jane Austen is much more like the expansive fantasy universes. Yes, I would agree with that. With it. You have various Dickens Christmas festivals and things like that, and mm. you know, mainly mainly as a way to get people to go to a Christmas market. Um, but. But nothing, and, and I'm sure there will be Dickens lectures and things like that, but nothing like on the scale that you get, um, for example, the Jane Austen Festival in Bath every year, where literally, I think on the mar on the promenade last year, we had well over 500 people alone. And that was just for the promenade. That wasn't all the people that came in across the week to attend lectures, balls, that sort of thing. So it's very, very, and people from right across the world as well. So you can go, you know, to Pakistan and there'll be an absolutely um, uh, full on fan club um, going there. Australia, Austria and America. Oh, my goodness. She's so popular in America. Um, so so it's I think she's as popular as she's ever. Well, probably more popular as we've discussed than she was yeah. when she was actually publishing her books at the first time, because so many people know about her now. So that's the sort of last place I wanted to go with this, really, which is. Um... We can't see frame breakers and AI in her actual novels, but we do see her re response to change. Hmm. I think there are some ways in which her novels to us feel timeless. Hmm. And there's this idea that, in a sense, there is little village, her little, you know, miniature village that she talks Microcosm about. Microcosm. Yeah. Condition. Yeah. But actually, if you read it carefully, you're aware that in many ways it's it's reflecting change so in her own family let's start there so mm -hmm. the external to the novels she and her family were part of social change so her brothers in the ones in the navy were climbing up the social ranks mm -hmm. through their own 
merit, not yes. through uh, land. Thank you so much. Whereas, of course, her brother, who was adopted, he was doing that route. Yes. Uh, but there is there is ch social change happening through a sort of meritocracy of of a of an early sort at the time. Yes. But what about her? She is a woman earning an independent amount of money through writing. Yes. So that she did have some predecessors uh, and some and some people at the same time as her. Yes. But uh, there aren't that many of oh, very much. Um, yeah, very much uh, an individual thing to do. And the fact that she had to hide her name uh, and just say it was written by a, a lady. Uh, so there was still uh, so much stigma to be a woman writer, uh, let alone to be a successful woman writer. Um, you might scribble a few things down as Jane started off entertaining your family at home, and that was perfectly acceptable. But to actually publish novels um, was was seen as, you know, very much stepping out of your sphere and, and poss possibly raising your head above a parapet where you would as likely get brickbats as, as bouquets. Um, so she was very brave to do that. And, and I think she actually turned down an offer of marriage in order to continue doing that. And that was incredibly brave at the time because marriage, as she says in her many novels, was your livelihood and your the career you were supposed to follow as a woman. So, um, yes, yeah, she did have the support of her family, and, and obviously that helped tremendously. But she was still very brave in saying, no, I want to choose career over motherhood. So she embraces change, not in a sort of Mary Wollstonecraft, no. fling your bonnet over the... <laughs> it's not that sort of really challenging kind of Violent change. Violent change, yeah. Uh, which came with a very high price tag yes, uh, for absolutely. her. But Jane Austen in her own... She was quietly Most rebellious. Humble, <laughs> humble, I think. I think yes. the opera's yes. word, humble way. Yes. Um, she is changing what she's changing the nature of the idea of an author by mm. being so dashed professional about it as well, because mm. there's plenty of the Radcliffian excess, but she actually strikes a very different note. And um, I think if you if you read any uh, contemporary novels of the time, like Mrs. Radcliffe's *The Mysteries of Udolpho*, the the freshness of Jane Austen's style compared to those is it's all it's almost revolutionary if you if you compare mm. to what, uh, and that's why it still speaks to us today because it is so immediate and, and none of the other books were were well that I've read um, were anywhere near to being as chatty and and as though a friend was speaking to you. It was they were either incredibly moralistic or incredibly fantastical, uh, but nothing like um, your your well, own experiences. I, what do I you put think? In, I put in a word for Fanny Burney and Mariah yeah. Edgeworth, yeah, both yeah. of whom have are. Uh, if you're looking for other voices from that era, mm. there are some books there worth reading. Like Evelina. yeah, I would say those are the better ones. Definitely. Yeah, and Mariah Edgeworth was very experimental, so she mm. write, she writes books in um, like Irish brogue and and really mm. sort of and social person. satire yeah. so um she's very interesting as well mm -hmm. anyway so these ladies <laughs> these women are, are actually embracing change mm. but let's have a look actually in her novels there is i think she she's a bit like shakespeare it's not necessarily <clears throat> excuse me it's not necessarily clear what she thinks but you can see that she is able to see all sides of this Mm. So I came up with two sort of people on other ends of the spectrum. So yes. she's quite happy to poke fun at vulgar change, mm -hmm. who for me, that is someone like Mrs. Elton in Emma, who comes mm -hmm. in, she's obviously a sort of nouveau riche type background. Yes. And she comes in boasting about her cousin's, I think it's her cousin's Baruch Landau. She's sort of like her little yes. talisman. It's like somebody coming in and talking about their Porsche. Yes, and, um, and wanting to shake up the the obviously quite staid uh, village of Highbury, mm. uh, you know, forming book clubs and music clubs and things, and yeah, she's all about change and uh, and making herself the the new social doyen of of the the very small probably uh, village circle. And and when you mention change, 
uh, who better to mention than uh, Mr. Woodhouse, who is the exact opposite of wanting change. He wants everything to stay the same and always has done. And in fact, is shown as, some, as somebody who doesn't want change as being incredibly selfish because mm. poor Emma says to her, sorry, spoilers, people, uh, <laughs> says to Mr. Knightley, um, I can't marry you, having initially said, yes, I will love to marry you. Uh, because I can't leave my father. He will not be able to cope with that change. Um, so uh, Mr. Knightley, being ever the gentleman, uh, says, yes, you know, baby steps. I, I will stay with you uh, as, as long as Mr. Woodhouse is alive and then we can remove to my house. Uh, but he accepts that Mr. Woodhouse will absolutely hate change. Yeah, and then the other person on that, and sort of a bit more flamboyantly so, mm. is Lady Catherine de Burr. Mm -hmm. comes in uh, forces herself in a very rude way upon this gentleman's household to basically tell <laughs> Elizabeth everything that's wrong with her and <laughs> things that are wrong with her basically is she's not good enough mm. she's of a of a lower social standing she how dare she raise her eyes she is to, above her station yeah yes um and I don't think Jane Austen has much truck with that kind of lording it over person or mm. leading it over person <laughs> um so I, I think perhaps her actual attitude to change is, is, is context dependent. She's not yes. adverse to it, no. but she's also not ready to... Um, Throw everything away. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I mean, don't forget Jane Austen, uh, as people often, often say, she's in the period of the most extreme change possible, mm. which is the Napoleonic Wars. Um, uh, actual fearful change and it's almost like volcanoes erupting everywhere in fact volcano did erupt um yes. <laughs> they had the, they had the the summer with no sun basically because of that but the napoleonic wars were just absolutely horrific in terms of such extreme change so um yeah if you if you had overthrowing monarchies you know and 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 invading countries left right and center and britain being fearful the entire time and that's what her brothers were fighting to prevent uh being overrun by the french and it was a very real threat that, that several times there were small incursions by french raiding parties you know along the coast and things like that so it was absolutely um turmoil uh going on there, there was the industrial revolution just around the corner there was war that had been going on for years um, and, and yes, Jane Austen wasn't taking part in that, but she was certainly aware of that change. So to, to focus in on the life that she knew, which was uh, more domestic, um, uh, she could have uh, done a, a sweeping epic, but I don't think we would have got half the enjoyment out of that um, as, yeah. as we did small uh, uh, changes going on with, with her characters. Thank you. So let's finish by deciding what, what would Jane Austen do about AI if she was right now? <laughs> Let's bring her in our time machine, our thought time machine. Mm. What do you what do you feel she would make of it if she was a writer at work today? Well, I think the Oxford Union um, actually uh, had a debate uh, by by the business school as part of its executive diploma in AI for business programs. And the, the, the uh, motion was, this house believes most of the world's content will soon be created by AI. And it was debated at the Oxford Union by an AI system trained on millions of pages of classic texts and modern online content. And it mimicked above, uh, from others, William Shakespeare, Jane Austen, Oscar Wilde and Winston Churchill. So uh, they've, they've all got um, in the style of uh, rebuttals or, or, or beliefs and uh, one of the things it said um, uh, it, it says meanwhile in considering a view modelled on Mrs Bennett from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice the AI gave a more pro-robot view uh, and it, it, it uh, complete with gender stereotyping learned from the novel itself highlighting the risk of bias in artificial intelligence uh, so it says speaking almost as Mrs Bennett you see, there are now programs that can help create content that is more attractive to potential suitors. Uh, my husband and I are very excited about this new technology, and we believe that it will be a great help to our daughters in finding good husbands. Um, so that, that's what it generated as, as possible. But I, I think personally, uh, I've, I've been following the debates by a lot of modern authors who have basically had their work 
appropriated by mm-hmm. artificial intelligence and whole books published with that author's name on. Um, so basically, it's it's like um, uh, stealing their identities and they're publishing incredibly substandard books. But you only realize that when you buy the latest Nora Roberts or wh- whoever uh, and then suddenly realize, well, hang on a minute. Nora's really gone off the boil here. That, that's nothing like what she normally writes. But they're getting away with it. Uh, so new laws are coming to come into force to protect uh, novels uh, being basically wholesale nicked by artificial intelligence and republished as if they were that that authors it's it's quite uh, serious and, and the same with um art um so so famous paintings which are as you say out of copyright necessarily are, are being nicked wholesale uh, and a few few extra bells and whistles put on and, and basically they're nicking all sorts of painters copyrighted images uh, and re- replacing them as I've, you know, this is created by a robot. It's quite interesting that people can say, and a lot of Jane Austen fan clubs have been saying, oh, show me Lizzie Bennet and Mr. Darcy in a woodland setting uh, or by the seaside or, you know, uh, on a merry-go-round. And and you can just give it scenarios uh, and it will produce a picture for you, um, which, which is very interesting. And I think the main thing um, to be worried about, if, if I was an author and if I was Jane Austen, uh, would be people representing themselves as if they were me. Uh, so that's one thing that obviously she'd be quite concerned with. Um, but I think she'd definitely find fodder for laughing at a robot being creative because people um, say, oh, you know, artificial intelligence, it's so creative. Uh, it, it can cre- It's, it's uh, cognizant. It's got its own sentience. No, it hasn't. What it's doing is it's churning a heck of a lot of information all at once and just regurgitating it. And uh, as you've demonstrated with your poem and your story, it can often do that in a very lifelike way, but it's not actually thinking to itself, how can I put this in the best way? How can I uh, convey emotion? It's Mm. just regurgitating it in a way that it's learned to do um, through cobbling together lots of uh, stories and text. I think there's a danger which people are pointing out now which as we get because this is all very recent yeah that these models are now being trained on ai generated text yeah so there's a a fear about sort of uh information collapse yeah so that the rather than a real person having been the basis something like the snowflakes inside that i pointed yeah. out in that thing yeah. becomes in, uh hardwired in hardwired that's not the right word but you know <laughs> um sort of accepted as a norm and then you end up with a more and more nonsensical uh, version of information and people rely on it and then as you say get halfway through and think hang on a minute this none of this makes sense because there is no understanding mind guiding it i think you're right i think think what what would jane do she would create a fantastic character in the village who (laughs) is I don't know, an AI performance poet or something coming to the the, the musicale and saying, I'm, you know, me and my AI generator have come up with this song for your de- delectation. And everyone would be saying, no, 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 you've delighted us long enough. <laughs> um, anyway, so I think she would probably not get to, she would be moderate in her approach. Because I do think, obviously, there are clearly things where it's helpful, like checking for yeah. mistakes in coding, um helping people well, i think i think we all use ai whether we are aware of it or not already yeah. whether you whether you think you are um it's it's there it's there in, in everything we do we use it for shopping you uh you use it jane austen fans um every time you like story you see on social media it will usually find another story to entertain you as well because it's it's recognized your likes so that's yeah. AI. so i th- i think that um she would be in the cautious but <laughs> open to change camp maybe yes. it's whether we like it or not it's here uh and i think when when somebody actually asked an artificial intelligence tool to discuss the ethics of its own technology it concluded that the only way to stop such tech from becoming too powerful is to have no artificial intelligence at all and i'm sorry folks that that box is uh, opened by pandora and it's out there yeah so i think what we do is is have legislation governing um 
theft. Um, but I'm not too worried at the moment um, because, uh, as I say, all I can see it doing mainly is is churning out a lot of uh, text uh, and, and, and representing as best it can. Where I think we need to be particularly careful is people so often believe the evidence of their eyes, um, especially if it's an emotive subject, um, whereas now uh, somebody can be said to have said something and it could be AI, it could be a deep fake, as they call it, uh, and actors particularly are very worried at the moment um, because they can be represented to be doing things or, or fo fo a photograph, apparently, of them doing something and it's not them at all. It's a massive subject. So um, I think we've dealt with our little corner of it, though, <laughs> our little miniature of it sufficiently. So um, we're now going to turn to our Lady Catherine and Elizabeth Bennett of the yeah. episode. And I think as we're recording this towards the end of 2023, mm. we might want to think, you feel free to think about the whole year who's been yes. Lady Catherine or Elizabeth Bennett. Oh, that's a big, big thing to do. <laughs> um, or it could be something more recent if that strikes you. Yes, I can. I can do that. OK, so do you have a contender for... Strangely, I do. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, I, I, I'd say uh, our Darcy rather than the Lady, uh, rather than the Z of the week is uh, rugby league star Kevin Sinfield has begun a, his fourth challenge to raise money to support people affected by motor neurone disease. Uh, the 7 in 7 challenge will see the former Leeds Rhinos player run an ultra marathon every day for seven days in seven cities in December. So it's the latest in a series of runs which have raised over 8 million. That's one person just raising that. Uh, and he said, running the 27 miles or 43 kilometres each day would be my toughest challenge. Me getting from the sofa to the kitchen <laughs> it can, can cause me to be out of breath. So good luck for him. Uh, so he's doing this for an ex-teammate, Rob Burrow, who was diagnosed with a condition in 2019. And he's raised absolutely millions for charity. So well good done. Good for him. him. Yeah, good for him. My uh, Wickham or uh, Lady, uh, Lady Catherine. Uh, it's, it's more of a group of people, this. Mm. And, and uh, it, it, again, showing the absurdity of, of social media, rather, which I think Jane would thoroughly approve of. A group of tourists fell in a Venice canal recently when their gondola capsized after they reportedly ignored orders by the gon gondolier to stop taking selfies. The gondolier shouted at them to sit down and stay still as he tried to manoeuvre under a bridge. They're not very big in Venice, according to local media. But they apparently ignored him. To their detriment, and all the weight ended up on one side, capsizing the boat and flipping them into the cold canal. The gondolier helped one to shore and then dived back in to rescue the others from the Rio de, de la Verona. Uh, and onlookers, of course, uh, instead of jumping in to help, filmed Saturday's spectacle, and footage of the drenched tourists clinging to the boat went viral on sites like TikTok. So social media account Venetia non e Disneyland, which stands for Venice is not Disneyland. <laughs> so the group were given a warm place to dry off. No one was hurt in the accident, except obviously their pride. Um, so, so and uh, possibly their camera phones. Possibly, obviously their camera phones. So, talk about uh, a watery karma. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's rather nice. So, my uh, Darcy Wickham slash uh, Elizabeth um, Lady Catherine is the same thing. It's mm -hmm. what we've been talking about. I feel this year AI has been the theme. And I think it's both Darcy and Wickham. <laughs> I think it can be Darcy. It can help us. Yes. It can also be Wicked Wickham, barring <laughs> away, feeding us misinformation, misrepresenting things. In fact, it's very Wickham-like, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm going to nominate as my 2023 Darcy and Wickham AI. <laughs> Very good, very good. So I've having vanished down the rabbit hole of artificial intelligence, it obviously got me thinking, how would Jane Austen's characters use artificial intelligence? So, for example, Mr. Darcy might get one to write a better proposal for him than he managed uh, initially, at least. Emma Woodhouse might get an art app to tell her <laughs> Harriet Smith holding an urn might look like and then print it out in a frame, saving herself having to spend far too much time drawing, drawing it herself. Uh, Mr. Wickham might use it to pretend he had written a scandalous novel, passing it off as his own work, of course. Marianne Dashwood would chat about sonnets with an imagine, imaginary AI chatbot handsome poet. 
Lizzie Bennett's prejudices might be reinforced if she only gets social media posts about the plight of handsome officers snubbed by former employers. <laughs> Lady Catherine would enjoy ordering her AI servant about, Alexa, order my carriage. <laughs> Alexa, play the piano. And Alexa, give me the address of Elizabeth Bennett. Uh, Catherine Morland might suggest to John Thorpe the benefits of a self-driving carriage. Uh, and finally, Sir Walter Elliot would enjoy using various filters to make himself look even more handsome. If oh, true. absolutely. <laughs> Hooray. That's definitely uh, a, a great place to stop. <laughs> and before we bow out from 2023, yeah. do you have any Jane Austen news for us, Katie? I do. I do. Two little bits. Um, so one of them is if you have ever attended the Jane Austen Festival in Bath, which you, know you have, Julia, as a speaker and as somebody gadding about having a good time, uh, so it says uh, the, they are looking for stewards already for next year, for 2024. So uh, you basically apply uh, via the Jane Austen Centre, uh, Jane Austen Festival. So it says if you have ever attended a Jane Austen Festival event, chances are you met one of our busy, hardworking volunteer stewards. If you admired our lovely team at work and thought that looks like the crazy busy role for me, we'd love to hear from you. And there's a form uh, on their website, which we're, I can give you the link for. Uh, so they've got an application form that asks questions like, you know, how fit are you? <laughs> are you able to dash across Bath in full Regency gear? Um, so the obviously the advantage to being a Jane Austen Festival steward is you get to attend a lot of lovely events for free. Um, but uh, don't expect to attend all the lovely balls uh, on one hour's work in the entire week. So you've got to earn that <laughs> prestigious thing. So, uh, you, you know, you, you obviously get to interact with a lot of wonderful people from around the world and they work very, very hard, um, but they have a heck of a lot of fun as well. So, you know, you, so we'll you know. put the, the link for that in the show notes so people can pull that up. And the other the other bit of note. Uh, so uh, those of you who have been lucky enough to visit Jane Austen's house and you will realise that her brother's rather grander house, Chawton House, is literally about several hundred yards down the road. I was amazed to see how near the two were together. So Chawton House is absolutely beautiful. And if you ever watch the BBC documentary Having a Ball, that is at Chawton House, which is a beautiful place. Uh, so it says, stuck for Christmas plans and desperate to get away, we are offering our three-bedroom annex apartment for a unique Christmas holiday stay. Four to five nights for up to six people. Nestled within the main building of Chawton House, the apartment exudes character, providing a cosy and peaceful space in the stunning Hampshire countryside for an idyllic festive escape. It's back to your poem again. Guests will have the gardens to themselves during the Christmas period, in addition to complimentary access to the house. On opening days, 22nd, 23rd and 27th of December, make this holiday season truly special by choosing Chawton House as your festive retreat. And again, there's a link for the Airbnb for that, which I think would be amazing. Um, yes, and if it's not, if it's already gone for this year, it's something to put in for next year, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we hope that um, if the people who do book that, their carriage approaches through a wintry scene, bringing joy, hope, and a romantic dream. And snowflakes falling inside. And apparently. snowflakes. <laughs> yes. So thank you, everybody, for listening, and we look forward to speaking again in 2024. Have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.